Hey everybody, uh, Weekend Modder here with a live stream, uh, a little bit to make up for the kind of blank live stream that we did the other day. So uh, here with a Corona uh, 16 megabyte console um, that we're going to live stream and generate a bit more of a tutorial with a Matrix V1 with the onboard oscillator and do a muffin style install. Uh, hang out with me. All right, so the last video that I posted was kind of what I called a pro guide for uh, how to do the muffin, covered the basic points. What I've gone ahead and done is actually generated a kind of more official tutorial image here. So you can see a copy of it, but I want to make sure everybody knows how they can get one of those for themselves. Uh, what's up, Mod Shop, XV Mods, Old Bay, Null Rudix, yo, 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 what's up, guys? Thanks for watching. Um, so you can head over to weekendmodder.com, regular plain old weekendmodder.com, and then on the left side there's the uh, little guidebook here under Corona RGH2. If you just scroll down, here's the muffin style install guide. So this is basically what we're going to be following today uh, and then doing a, a, a quick live install here. So we've got the image for reference, we've got JRunner up here, and then uh, we'll go ahead and get to it. So uh, given that this console is a 16 megabyte NAND, which we can tell by uh, by looking at the uh, reference image or, or by, the, by the NAND here. Um, we're going to use a standard NANDX to do the read write. Uh, we'll use the NANDX to do the timing file programming, and then we will uh, um, I don't know, boot Zell and stuff. If you were doing a um, four gig console, right? that feeling when he says your name, I like it. Um, if we were doing a 4 gig console, the process would be exactly the same. The only thing that would change would be how you read and write the NAND. So we're going to use the, the kind of the JTAG header ports here to read and write the NAND, but if you were using a, a, or doing this on a 4 gig console, um, all of the other points would stay the same. It's just to read and write the NAND, you would use this pad down here with the 4 gig chip and something like the SD tool. Uh, when you RGH Jaspers, if you're doing a 256 or 512, when does JRunner glitch and flash wrong images? When? Why? Uh, you must be misbehaving somehow with wh what you're doing. I don't know. It doesn't flash and do wrong images. Um, sometimes JRunner can't always automatically tell the difference between like a 16 meg and a 256 and whatever, but uh, frankly that generally doesn't matter either. So we've used our scratch pin. Go ahead and take that coating off the top, and then we'll apply some flux paste there, and uh, go ahead and get the uh, NAND point soldered up here. So let's get that done. So we're just pre-tinning the pads so that there's some solder stuck to them so that when we get ready to connect our wires that's going to run to the Nandex, we can do that without a problem. So on this side, um, we're only going to need to do the ground point, which is going to be this one, which having to hold heat too longer is pretty normal if you guys watched my streams at all and stuff. Having to hold heat on that ground point for a little while longer is totally normal. Normally we would do E and F. That's not used in this style of install. So we'll do this point, which is the 3 volt 3, aka the power spot. And then whether or not you do these next two would depend on whether you've got a 16 meg console or a 4 gig. These are basically the blue and green wires that go with the the Nandex NAND reading wire. So if you were doing a 4 gig console, you would not do the two points that I am tinning right now, the upper one and then the lower one. You would have stopped with just the ground and the power. But this is uh, blue and green respectively, um, and those are NAND read write points for this particular console. 
Uh, metal mods. What did you say here? I found out Matrix V1 when we were talking about the messages. A trace was cut from shipping. It looked like the package had been dragged across concrete. Oh, that sucks, man. Shippers must have been uh, crazy uh, bad about it. Um, so now we've got all our points tinned up. We're going to go ahead and use our set of Nandex wires. And uh, the color coding diagram for this is built right into JRunner. You can go to Slim Nandex install for Corona and pull those images right up. Um, and they're super easily Googleable per motherboard. Right, how to connect Nandex to Corona, whatever. So I don't even um, touch on those in the the install image anymore. So black, brown, red, orange, yellow is what goes on this side. So that was just the red wire. I get the orange one in here. Yellow, which is again ground, so if we have to hold our iron on it for a little longer, that's kind of normal. No big deal. All right, and then blue, I'll get a little bit of fuzz on there. There we go. Blue and green. All right. So uh, now we've got our NAND headers installed. We could go ahead and read and write the NAND. What I'm going to do real quick is actually just pretend the pads that we're going to make use of. So for that, I just want to point out the, the reference image again. So I, I uh, marked up two of the matrix chips just because there are some slight variants of them. So you can see that the pattern is the same. I tried to label X with the ones that are going to be unused, and it is consistent per image here. So we're going to use power and ground, obviously, and then A is going to be RST, B is post, uh, C would normally be the clock, but we have to use, because it's a corona, the onboard clock via the crystal. And then we're going to go uh, E to the point DB2G3, which is kind of the CR4 point. Um, and then, uh, the, so the rest of those will be left blank. So, if we want to do this consistently, um, we'll go ahead and pretend. We'll go power, right? Ground. A, which is going to be RST. B, which is going to be post. And then again, so C is not used, D is not used, E is that DB2G3 point, and then F is also unused. And then on this upper point, what we want to do is bridge to the two pads towards the slim side. So I'll put some solder on that middle pad, I'll put some solder on this uh, further pad, and then we just kind of drag them together so they join, right? So we've bridged those two pads towards the slim side. You can do the lower one as well, but I don't see it recommended anywhere else, and I haven't uh, needed to do that. So, um, so yeah, we can go ahead and back up, and I'm going to turn the camera a little bit here while I connect standby power to the console. Go ahead and plug in my Nandex, and then uh, we'll hit J Runner here. We'll use the little query button. Get a valid flash config for a Corona is great. We'll say read NAND. We get our little uh, pop-up here. We'll say OK. And then it's going to take a few minutes while it reads uh, both of these NANDs. Dude, so Metal Mod said, dude, you did the muffin install on a Trinity using the alternative points and got some Insta boot times. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm really digging this, uh, the muffin style install. And this is actually with the uh, onboard 48 megahertz um, crystals and there are a separate set of timing files for using a hundred megahertz crystal which are supposedly more precise so these little crystals these guys that are on the the chip are 48 megahertz and it's doubling it in software and using 192 or four multiplying it by four and getting to 192 but 
The theory goes, if we could replace this crystal with a 100 megahertz crystal and use a slightly different timing file, that we might could even get even better. So I'm actually working with my supplier. I've had a couple of emails back and forth so far, trying to, um, yeah, Super 360, thanks to 15432 for sure, trying to get a hold of some matrix with no crystal on them and then buy a corresponding amount of uh, 100 megahertz crystals and populate them with those and give that some tests. So, yeah, for a fat, you can disable the crystal uh, ZAZZ code. You're, you're right about that one. That, that's true. However, you can actually use the onboard clock on fats as well. It's just because they have an exposed clock, uh, a, a point that you can just solder to, it makes more sense to just use the onboard clock. So you're, you're definitely right there. No, no problems. Uh, looking up. Do, 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 do. For a fat, you need to disable the quartz. Yep. Every time I talk about crystal, you think of Breaking Bad. <laughs> no, not that kind of crystal. Uh, that's that's not a kind of crystal that I am interested in. So. Just what? Just, just yeah, just crystal my wife. Which I'm not sure if she realizes that means that now all you guys know her name, but. It's not exactly a secret before. Yeah, the, the only crystals I'm interested in are oscillators and my wife. That's kind of funny. All right, so this part's kind of stagnant while we're waiting for the NANDs to read. Um, so we got the first complete good read. Um, what chip would I recommend to mod a Trinity, Old Bay? Uh, so if... If you're a brand new first timer, I think the Matrix and doing the Muffin install in the Trinity is probably the, the lowest risk. If you're pretty confident in your soldering and you want the easiest, very fast boot times, an Ace V3 in the CR4 speedup configuration might. Um, metal mods, couldn't you just remove the 48 crystal and replace with another one and maybe resell? Sure. Yeah, but I can get the ones with no crystal for cheaper than I can get ones with an existing crystal, and then I don't have to remove one to replace it. So actually, in an ideal world, um, it would be great if I could actually convince the manufacturer to make a run of these with the 100 megahertz on them. So what I'm trying to do at, at right now is just get my hands on a few 100 megahertz crystals that are in this same package as what's used on these chips, these little guys. So if I can just get a few hundred megahertz crystals to test with, if it's as good as I think it will be, uh, then I might try to see if I can get a supplier to make me a bunch of them pre-made with the 100 megahertz on them and buy a few hundred. Because here's the deal, if we do this and, and we get the 100 megahertz and it boots as good as I think it will for the, the, the increased accuracy, then really the Matrix V1 becomes the only chip that, that I would need to carry, right? Because on FATS, on FATS I can use a Matrix for RGH 1.2 and get instant boots. On Trinities I would do a muffin install with the, the Matrix and get, I already get really nice boots with the 48 megahertz crystal. And then on the Corona as well. Sorry about the super loud noise, guys. That was J Runner finishing up and uh, happily giving us a NANS or the same message. Uh, always like to throw out there, too, that if you have any comments in here about bad blocks and then remapping kind of happens in here, as long as at the end you get NANS are the same and remapped, uh, then you're totally fine. So, Super says, I tried the muffin on a Trinity with Matrix boots, were really decent for a $3 chip. Would love to try the higher clock and see what happens. Me too, dude. I'm, I'm working on it. As soon as I can get some of those 100 megahertz crystals, we're going to make it happen. Muffin is cool and all, but SRGH is life. Yeah, there's something. There's a lot to be said for the uh, Ace V3 chips and SRGH. Those work phenomenally as well. I've done many, 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 many of those installs. All right, so now we've got our NAND successfully read. Time to do our uh, very quick... Uh, like five wire install here. 
So first ones I'm going to do are going to go up to this point. We're going to do ground and power, right? So I'm just going to get started. So this is our 3 volt 3 point for power. Having some trouble holding the wire still. There we go. So we'll just get that connected here. Take and trim the wire length. And I know I'm blocking the shut with this, but I'm just trimming, trimming some of the insulation off so that I can uh, expose that. And let me find my tweezers. Metal Mod says, your recommendation is buy a broken Trinity and test out a few points, what heat they can withstand, and educate yourself. Sure, that's that's not a bad test. Uh, Zazzy Z says, 512 big block. Um, yeah, so Muffin, uh, so uh, I don't want to answer it. So Dag for Live 05 says, what's the difference between Muffin and SRGH? So SRGH was... Uh, I want to say the earlier version of the timing files attempting to use kind of the CR4 speed up type activity released by 15432 aka the Mad Russian uh, to whom we owe many many thanks for freely releasing this stuff and uh, later on he released this muffin style where essentially we're doing the exact same thing as a CR4 the $25 chip from Team Executor uh, but we're just doing it using a really inexpensive chip um, so that's pretty much the deal is that the uh, muffin style is a pretty close to copy of straight up CR4 yeah, CR4 slowdown. Um, so it actually installs exactly the same as well using the DB G, DB2G3, whatever the name of the point is. DB2G3, yeah, that's it. So I'm using the same red wire. That might annoy some people that my wires for power and ground are actually going to be the same color. Um, but the color of the wire does not affect its operation so uh, we've got power and ground wired up xbox one getting modded jesus lopez what where you say that where you got some uh uh where, where are you getting that info you got any facts or sources to back that up i'd be super interested in that sort of thing um so next point we're going to do is going to be the RST point. That's going to go to the underside of the board. So I'm going to go ahead and remove the console from uh, its housing here. And I'm just using leftover wires from other uh, activities. These are basically 28 or 30 AWG wires. Yeah, Super says XB1 is not modded at all. Mod Shop concurs. Yeah. Um, feel like your streams are to watch when you have nothing else to do like sitting on the toilet. <laughs> I, I guess that's a compliment. Emulators in dev mode. Yeah, there's way better emulator experiences. If, if you're only going to get emulators out of a mod, you might as well buy a Raspberry Pi and install emulation station on it and you'll have a, a better overall experience for 35 bucks. All right, so A is RST, so I've gone ahead and soldered that side to the board here. I'm going to run it through the hole right next to the south bridge. And then on the underside, I want to point you guys out to the reference image here again real fast. So the RST point is on the underside of the motherboard. There's this whole little cluster. And the way I think about it is like this row going up. It's the topmost little bitty tiny pad right there is the RST point so when we go over here where we came through that's gonna come to like right there is where that guy lives so go ahead and trim this just just longer than it needs to be and Strip the end a little bit. And then because this little point is so fragile, it's worth taking the extra time to go ahead and uh, 
pre-tin the end of this wire and then maybe even throw a tiny little bit so let's really get you in there yeah throw a tiny little bit of flux paste right over the spot and then actually I'm gonna hit it with an iron first let me ask you something. Ever had issues with the new post fix adapters? Um, so the Xbox One didn't run a sandbox environment though. What? Okay, hold on. Angel, I tried to mod Xbox 360 and it boot the blue screen. After that, it turns off and all you got was fan noise. So you got Zell. You're pretty close. You, you got to figure out what you did to get it to shut off here. Um, since you're here, let me ask you something. Have you ever had issues with newer post-fix adapters, bad batch? Yeah, there's actually a, a little video on my page for the post-fix adapters. Is it's, it's actually pretty common for me to run into a post-fix adapter that doesn't seat properly as it is. And I demonstrate in that video on my store page how you kind of have to clip the legs off of one side and hold it in. So... Um, yes, it, it, I have had issues with post-fix adapters, to answer your question. Go check out that video uh, on the post-fix page on my uh, um, store. Yep, Old Spice notification for messages on, on the phone. Um, so we hit the RST point here, and even though it gets comments every time, I still do it, and you guys know why I do it. I'll put a little dab of hot glue back here away from the point so that if anybody yanks on this thing, it won't just rip off that pad. So I'm uh, heating up the, the hot glue gun now. While we're doing that, um, we can start thinking about the next point, right? So B is going to go to post. And then the other thing to be uh, aware of, and I mentioned this actually if we go back to the reference image, is R2, C6, and 7 right here, these little guys. If they are not present, it's a generally a pretty good indicator that you are going to need a post-fix adapter. And on this console, which this is actually a photo of this exact console, um, these are not present. So given that fact, we don't need to bridge them because we're not using the E and F points. We're not using SDA and SCL. But the fact that they're not present clues us in to the idea that we probably need a post-fix adapter. So we're going to need a post-fix adapter on this console, I guess is ultimately what I'm saying. Sixteen thousand three hundred Bitcoin is up, man. I don't know if you guys are paying attention to that stuff or watching or interested in it at all, but. It's been a roller coaster lately. All right, so let's head back to the console here. So we know we're going to need a post fix adapter. My uh, my hot glue gun's warmed up enough that I can put a little bit down there. All right. So there's my hot glue back away from the point, not covering it, anything like that. So I'm going to go ahead and take the uh, the X clamp off. This is the uh, X clamp remover tool. You can definitely accomplish this with a screwdriver. These things are a couple of bucks. Yeah, I definitely I have a couple of Bitcoin. I'm, I'm definitely into that. That's pretty cool. Um, I, I think it's neat. I've been I've been into Bitcoin since like 2011, so I have a few. Um, and it has it hit like 19,000 for like 10 minutes this morning, something like that. Um, anyway. Uh, so now with the post fix, uh, excuse me, with the X clamp remover, we remove the X clamp, we can go ahead and flip the console over and work on installing our post fix adapter. And as you can see, we've got some dirt in there. This is a customer send in console. So there is our indication that we need the post fix. So if you look at the traces right there, you can see further down here how all the little lines are still continuing but to this row of dots there are no little lines no little traces so we definitely need a um, post fix adapter let's see do you have a few damn yep yeah I do uh, 
A couple, not not like a crazy amount or anything. I I bought ten for a hundred dollars in like 2011, and then as they went up in value over time, I spent through most of them. But I still have a couple left, so um, I have no idea at this point. I'm I'm figuring I'm gonna gamble on it and just hold them for a long time. Maybe they'll go to the moon. Maybe they'll go to zero. Who knows? All right, so here's my post-fix adapter. Just went and grabbed. We'll go ahead and get that thing set. Um, this isn't really new information, but the, the way that we, or the way that I install the post-fix and, and validate it is using a multimeter set to 200K, and then we take a reading between uh, ground and the, the, well, the post point. And so when we get that sucker on there, Use the retention clip. And this is the part that doesn't always want to behave exactly right. There we go. We got our retention clip in. So then what you want to see is when you touch. So this point, I'm just grounding out to the AV shield up here. I'm just going to put it right there. So I'm on ground. And then when I touch the point here, so notice the multimeter didn't go anywhere. It tells me that this thing is not making the contact that, that I would expect it to make. So um, not so shocking. Like I said, I have issues with um, post fix from time to time. And here's the technique that just about always works with it. So I remove the post fix, actually take my little uh, snipper tools and I cut off this side and then get myself a piece of tape lined up so I've got something that I can hold it in place so I just have a piece of tape here and then I'm holding over and then gonna gonna slide it down as I do that and then I'm just gonna hold some pressure on it and then use the tape to make sure it stays in place. So now that the tape is holding it, we'll get the uh, multimeter back out here, turn it back on. So again, the black up to the AV shield, I'm just grounding it out, and then I'm going to touch my little point here. And so I'm still not getting anywhere, not getting a reading. So basically just rinse and repeat. Oh, that wasn't good. I really don't like it when that pin turns and it's still under the, the XC GPU. That seems like the potential for damaging one of the little solder balls to me. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll actually push down on the pin here a little bit to kind of ensure that it's flexing downward and getting up under the XC GPU to make contact with what it needs to. So I'm up there slide it down, hold it in place, put our tape down, all right, and then now we'll retest again. So ground, man, really not having success with this one. Usually I don't have to install them more, more than twice. So occasionally I'll just walk away and grab a different post-fix adapter. Um, this one seems to be okay. I don't see anything obviously wrong with it. Um, so we'll give it another shot. My tape has lost some of its stickiness. The only way you found is to solder the needle closer to the CPU. Oh, like extending it? Um, that makes me nervous, man, because... What you're actually so, uh, touching is a tiny little solder ball underneath this. And if you exert too much force on that, I just have this fear that, that you could potentially damage right, that little solder ball. Or if, you know, if it's consistently applying more pressure than it really needs to, then, I mean, what are you long term doing to that console like is it one day the solder is going to get hot enough that it just like disconnects 
So I've very rarely had to actually adjust or move the needle. and had, uh, So there we go. Now I'm getting the reading that I expect, somewhere between 30 and 50, that sort of thing. So now that we've got it exactly in the spot that we want it, it does have some anchors that you can solder here. Um, but yet again, I find that uh, hot glue to the rescue. So I hold this anchor guy down, and I'm, I'm not putting it on the CPU at all, the XC GPU. I'm making sure that I'm, I'm doing this in areas that are well back away so that if I really had to, I could uh, use a little bit of rubbing alcohol, which uh, denatures the hot glue really quickly and uh, would allow that to be removed without too much issue. So, without having to move the needle or anything, uh, which is something that I would advise caution. Uh, if you want to do it, by all means. Um, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying that I would be very cautious. Uh, so how do I know what number to solder the wire on the post-fix adapter? All these traces are, or the idea is that they're simulating additional wire length. This whole area is just a trace run back and forth loop-de-loop. -loop. So in some early install types, they would tell you to use a post-fix wire that's like 50 centimeters long, right? So instead of needing to use a 50 centimeter long, Team Executor came out with the, the post-fix V2, which has a pad labeled 50. So all you would have to do is run a little short wire to the 50 pad, and you were simulating, you know, um, yeah, or go old school and literally solder a needle under the chip. Yeah, that, that's possible. So I don't leave the tape on, right? pull the tape back out and uh, actually do one little additional area of glue here and I know there's a lot of points here but man I've had a couple of instances where these things were not secured very well where I only soldered the anchors and then in shipping the console must have just got the absolute crap beat out of it and the postfix adapters actually came loose and then I had to have the console sent back to me, you know, basically for repair. So uh Angel, that's the uh the answer I just gave you, buddy. Numbers are wire lengths. Yeah. So now that we've got our post fix in, we can put our X clamp back on, right? If this would have had post intact we would have used the standard uh, post point right there. And that's also uh, indicated on the install image. So upper monitor here, let me show you. So the normal post point would be that little guy right there. But just like it says, if your post traces are intact, that's the point. If not, remember those traces that were missing, uh, you would be connecting to a post fix adapter. And that's exactly what we're doing in, in our particular install here. So we're going to go ahead and connect B up with the post fix adapter and I need a little something with a little more length to it. Here we go. So we'll go ahead and B on there and then I just uh, kind of out of habit use the five pad on the v2 which is the kind of the shortest one that's available to you there is the v1 which technically is an even more direct connection but for our purposes and for this install a v1 and a uh, v2 are roughly equivalent and I would suggest just using this same little five volt point. I didn't replace the thermal paste. You're absolutely right. Normally uh, on a console that I remove the heatsink on, I put fresh thermal paste on it. I didn't want to slow down the stream. I am going to go back and do that. I just, uh, I have until about 1.15 and it's one o'clock now, so I don't want to stop just to do thermal paste, which is super brain dead. All right. So our final connection that we need to make uh, is going to go from pad E down to db2g3 
So I need uh, a bit of wire with a little bit of length here. Uh, let's see. Come on, guy. I got my little scrap pile here. I think I got one. Oh, no. That's short. I might have to open a new wire pack. Oh, here's, here's one that's a little longer. Oh, sorry for the shaky cam. All right, so I'm going to go right from E. down to Ooh, shaky shaky DB2 G3 right off the front edge of the motherboard there and get that guy trimmed up right. strip it a little bit Put a little heat on the pad. Keep moving the board. Yeah, I'm not particularly proud of that connection, but come on, guy. I'm trying to rush. All right. So there is our connection with DB2G3, and same story as always, a little bit of glue up from the point in case it gets yanked on. And that is it. We have completed the wire install. It's actually just that many. It's not, it's not a, a ton of wires like some of the other installs. It's literally just power, ground, post, RST, and DB2G3. So we can go ahead and throw our console back in its case for some uh, safekeeping here. I'm going to go ahead and uh -oh, hold my, uh, my camera stand out. Go ahead and plug in the front ring of light. We're going to go ahead and plug in the uh, accessory power. I'm going to reconnect the Nandex here because what we're going to want to do is write the ECC file now. So we've taken our NAND reads. This is a CR4 method, right? So we want to say create ECC with glitch2 and CR4 checked. We'll say write ECC. That's going to happen real nice and fast because it's uh, only the first 50 blocks. And then if we uh, go ahead and come back to the camera, what we need to do now is real quickly just program the timing file to the glitch chip. So I use the programming cable with the Nandex here. I'm going to match up the VCC to VCC, TMS to TMS, that sort of stuff. So right now I've got it backwards, so I need to rotate it so that VCC lines up. And then insert that into the little holes. You get the little light on the chip, and then uh, the timing file that we're going to use is from the muffin pack under Corona, and I had real good success with this 3-1 file before. So we're going to use that same one, click run, and we should get a nice little dead message. And I know that might be super loud. Um, and then just to show you what it looks like on the chip itself, the light is off. I'm clicking run now. The little light lights up for the duration, and then it goes off as soon as it's completed. So now the timing file is programmed to the glitch chip. So now we've got the ECC written to the motherboard, the timing file programmed to the chip. We'll go ahead and hook up our HDMI cable, and in anticipation of getting our CPU key, I'm going to hook up the uh, Ethernet, and then I'm going to use uh, my infrared controller to turn the console on if I had it plugged in. So turn it on. And we should see some pulsing here, and hopefully, holy crap, look at that, first glitch insta-boot. So uh, here we should have Zell, no problem. So we've got Zell coming up, and uh, do you really need timing files? Yes, you need timing files. <laughs> Um, 
So you can see at the bottom here we've got an IP address because of our connection of the Ethernet cable. So I'm going to go uh, back up to JRunner. I'm going to enter that dot four eight. I'm going to say get CPU key. Pulls it in across the network. I've got my glitch two and CR four. So I'm going to go ahead and create my XE build image. While that's going on, I'm going to power off the console, disconnect Ethernet because I don't want to accidentally go online. I'm going to unplug power, replug power, plug the NANDX back into the NAND read write cables because now what I'm doing is I'm writing the final XE build image, right? So uh, we've generated our UPD flash.bin here. Um, oh, also just for anybody that's looking, this mega link up here, I also put it in the description of this video, but for anybody that has to try to copy down, this link is to the muffin timing files. So if you had to type it out or whatever, uh, there is the link to the muffin timing files. So anyway, now we've got the UPD flash.bin, and it's, um, crap, I keep clicking on OBS instead of the actual thing. The UPD flash.bin is loaded up here, so just say write NAND, and it's going to take about two minutes in order to uh, get this thing to uh, be fully written. Woodsy says, how do you get JRunner working? Because every time you start it, it says connection error. Okay, so I'm going to scroll up in my JRunner here and show you. What does this say? Connection error. That's totally normal. Connection error means that it can't connect to the JRunner servers. The JRunner servers have been offline for a couple of years now. So that connection error message is totally normal. Also, right-click Run as Admin. I also recommend setting your Windows firewall to block JRunner entirely because this little web pane over here tries to load some websites that are uh, pretty janky. Um, so my recommendation is just block firewall, uh, block JRunner completely in your firewall. A Corona that boots so fast, it's almost a miracle. If it crashes every time, you might try right-click Run as Admin. Uh, that seems to make JRunner pretty happy. Um, give that a shot. So we're almost through with writing our final NAND, and then we'll do a, a handful of boots here real quick to see if we get the same uh, really nice uh, muffin boot times out of this Corona that we did with the the last one from the kind of the pro video, as I called it, the high overview of the points. Again, check out uh, weekendmodder.com and then the Corona RGH2, and you can get the install guide that walks through exactly the points that we went through here. Uh, there's also videos, and I'll post this video on that page as well. But there's also videos on how to identify the four gig NANs versus the 16 meg NANs, and actually I have a lot of really good content broken down by motherboard type for just about every kind you could want. And then you can always hit the visit my store link and uh, pick up any of these products directly off of <laughs> store.weekendmodder.com for example the matrix glitcher for a measly five bucks and get CR4 like performance so that nice noise was that we completed in the two minutes writing the UPD flash.bin so we can go ahead and disconnect our Nandex I like to unplug power and then replug power anytime we've read or written the NAND and uh, yeah let's do some booting man so using the uh, the remote here So I'm definitely seeing some flashing, and I'm sure you guys can see that. And that was maybe maybe two pulses? I'm not positive. But we've got what's going to appear to be kind of a normal stock looking dashboard. Uh, super, no, those prices do not include shipping, but my shipping is real reasonable. You can get like five or ten chips shipped for like two or three bucks. So, um, yeah. So there we go, we booted up that time. We'll go ahead and power it off. And I think from now on I won't bother to show the Xbox screen. We'll just take the, uh, the ring of light animation as confirmation of the boot. Yeah, Jungle Flasher, my advice about putting JRunner in, in as blocked in the firewall also applies to Jungle Flasher. Jungle Flasher does the same crap. It tries to load some ad stuff. All right, so second boot. One, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 
Okay, so this is this is interesting. We've got like the solid light and it followed the pattern like I would expect a boot to happen, but we got no ring of light animation. Oh, was my HDMI cable loose? No, it didn't it didn't start. Um, so let's cut it off. We'll call that one a fail boot entirely. That's not that doesn't make me happy. So let's do this again. One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Look, I can count to ten. Eleven. So I'm expecting that pattern. Should have been a boot. Maybe I might actually have to play with the timing files on this one. So there is a boot that was maybe in the what 20, 25 second range. Unplug my network cable. My network cable is not plugged in, bro. Reaper Reaper, am I interested in trying a new DIY dual NAND method? Uh, to be honest, no. <laughs> dual NANDs are not my dig. I really like the Viper uh, that Mr. Modshop has kindly uh, set us up with. Uh, and I've done an install of that, but I, I really don't have uh, long-term um, information on that. If I didn't get it directly from... I'm, I'm using stock file on the ACE. Would a timing file from our zip file maybe help? No. The zip file that's being presented in this image or, or tutorial is for XC264A based chips or Rev C's and Matrix. It would not work on an ACE. I know I didn't replace the thermal paste. I did that intentionally. We already discussed that. Uh, Admiral Speedy, if you didn't get it from TX, it won't work. That is rubbish. Uh, there is basically nothing being produced by the official. Ofi official TX people anymore. All of the Rev C's coming out of China and stuff are clones at this point and they all work just fine. Alright, so that was the second boot, right? Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and try again. And maybe it'd be worth playing with a timing file on this one, but look at this. Look, that, so that time like super insta boot. So there's a little bit of variation here, but man, for a $5 chip, Admiral Speedy, I didn't read what you said. Where did you download it from? What are you talking about? You RGH your Corona V2 with an Ace V3, and you would say about every half dozen boots or so, it cycles forever. But if you unplug it, plug it back in, and try boot, it insta boots. That is relatively common based on my experience, and I don't know of anything that you can do to permanently fix that. But yeah, every half dozen or dozen times or something like that, that makes sense. Admiral Speedy is saying if you download JRunner from the TX forums, it will not work. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know that. I have a version of JRunner posted on a YouTube video on my channel about, I don't know, 15 or 20 videos back. Uh, grab that one. So, uh, let's do one final boot here, and I'm going to have to call it because I have got to get ready to go to my day job. But I think you guys have seen a, uh, the, the previous review. I booted that one four times, insta-boot almost every time. We've booted this one. I think this will be the fourth time. We did have one weird failure to boot, so there is something to be concerned about here, um, but not overly so. Every now and then to have a failure to boot is not the end of the world. It is an RGH. It's a glitch, right? So um, that, that does happen. There's another insta-boot. So I'm saying something like three out of four insta-boots, um, without doing any sort of tuning on the timing file, I could play with some of the other uh, timing file versions. Um, so yeah. Anyway, the uh, results are in. I am really digging the muffin install on Coronas. I think I may stop using the Ace V3s on Corona and exclusively use the muffins here. I'm going to push forward with trying to get some 100 megahertz crystals, and if that improves things even, uh, even further, then that would be amazing, and I might end up be, with this being the only chip that I use as RGH 1.2 in FATS, and then Muffin in Slims and Trinities. So thank you guys very much for hanging out with me. It's uh, a fun time as always. Uh, enjoy. Have a good day.